I, I'm, I'm, as you can see, I'm big, uh, which means I'm not a dancer. So um, I um, approached this project uh, very conscious of the fact that I was not a dancer, although I took some lessons years ago to actually learn some ballet um, syntax. And the other thing I want to say is that I'm an archival rat. Um, I think that was underscored in the introduction, which means that um, my impulse in, in taking on this project, um, which requires some convincing in my own head as well as from others, uh, was to actually look into the deep and wonderful history of what I consider to be the greatest theater in the world and the greatest ballet company in the world. Um, it's, um, this is a book that um, began uh, three or four years ago, uh, but built on many years of research in the 20th century. But what I was fascinated ultimately by was um, how uh, ballet communicates and what it means. And I thought actually I'd start with, with a simple music example of, of a ballet that everybody knows, which is the Nutcracker, which has a very tangential relationship to the Bolshoi Theatre. Uh, but then actually pivot to actually talking about um, how the construction of ballet changed over time and the role that um, the Bolshoi Ballet has played in uh, this most uh, intoxicating art form. I think most of you here will agree that it's, that it's a real narcotic. Um, but let me actually just play something. Um, I, I don't want to sort of bore you with my voice uh, too much. I'll play something and then talk about why I consider this very, very simple piece of music by Tchaikovsky to be absolutely magical. Uh, Tchaikovsky was uh, the magician of taking simple things and turning them into gold, um, which actually was important to um, so you'll all know this, I think, uh, this is the pas de deux from uh, the end of uh, um, so here we go. This is a Gergiev uh, conducting. You know, I think we've all seen it, right? I mean, I have. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, what is it about? Uh, that's kind of up for grabs. And this biographer, David Brown, he, he really didn't understand this. The, the plies, it didn't really make any sense, and I kind of agreed with him. And, uh, and he also said, you know, what is this? This is the culminating moment in this ballet, and it's a descending scale. And I could not filter <laughs> Elisha done better than a descending scale. But a dee da 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 dum um, is beautiful, because that tips that major into minor and lends it this kind of pattern, this kind of color, uh, which suggests something sadder, even though it's the culmination of this ballet. Um, Tchaikovsky um, had a hard time uh, composing this ballet score. Now, this is the last of three. The first one, Swan Lake, is obviously the most famous ballet in the general repertoire, um, and it was the one that was forgotten until after he died, uh, for reasons I'll get into with, it, with regard to the Bolshoi. But um, you know, there's, there's some wonderful details associated with the Nutcracker that I think are, are worth pointing out in terms of how ballet can communicate. Uh, one is that um, when he uh, was writing this score on commission from the Imperial Theatres in St. Petersburg, for the Mirinsky, um, he uh, went to Cambridge to get an honorary PhD and he stopped in Paris and there he actually went into a music shop and there was, he was introduced to a tuning instrument it's made out of metal bars and that since it's made out of metal, the pitches don't change, so it's good for tuning your string instruments, and he got it into his head that actually this magical sound could be used for something like, you know, the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he also um, composed it um, and had terrible composer's block. 
and this is that he struggled uh, putting together this score. This is somebody who, uh, you know, had, uh, could download uh, music very quickly. Queen of Spades, that opera, was 44 days flat in piano score, which is miraculous when you think about it. But he had he had trouble with this, um, and part of the trouble results in its odd construction that the first first half of uh, Nutcracker is kind of uh, more or less pantomime for children, and then the second half is dances. So that's that's odd. Um, but his sister died, and he loved her very much. And um, it, he was suddenly flooded with recollection. I'm romanticizing him a bit, but he deserves this um, because he was a genius. Like, like I don't think uh, we we saw since Mozart. Um, and um, but he was flooded with reminiscences of her um, and being at, at her place. And one of the things she, he she remember he remembers about her was putting on a, a tea kettle. And making green tea, and bria pa pa da, bria pa is the whistle, you know, becomes the Chinese dance. Um, and then the, the, wind, the wind wrapping around the, the home, is the wolf, that's a beautiful piece of synesthesia that the, the symbolists were completely enchanted with, that beautiful uh, waltz of the snowflakes. And the other thing that was pointed out by a very smart um, ballet historian and Tchaikovsky and a lover, uh, Roland John Wiley was that um, there's this insistence that you hear there in this da 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 pattern, and that's pr pretty common throughout the work. And it's been actually remarked that that's actually an intonation, you know, according by Sasafkov, of a uh, Russian requiem chant, the Panahida, and that he might have been memorializing his sister all the way through this piece. So it has this um, strangely beautifully melancholic dimension to it. You know, it's reminiscences of childhood. It's about the fact that children, you know, have a more, uh, you know, can can deal with more fright in their imaginations than adults. Uh, and certainly, my little girl is, is, has a great capacity for scaring herself. And so, there's there was a lot of scary music for Drosselmeyer that you know was kind of suppressed in the compositional process and didn't come out. But then, um, that second act, um, recent research has shown, is actually a weirdly allegorized version of the feast, coronation feast for Nikolai II. Um, which was outside of Moscow, and all of the goodies, the, the beer, and the, well, there's not a dance for beer, but there's you know various dances that are associated with all these goodies. Seem to be has this imperial dimension as well. Um, so all of that became um, in the mix this work that um, <coughs> dissonant semantically, but not syntactically. It's very tonal, but it's dissonant semantically in that the pieces don't really fit together. How can it be imperial? Um, and then childlike, and then reminiscence, and then public at the same time. But this is what Tchaikovsky at the end, pushing into a kind of space. Had he lived longer, he would have been a surrealist, I think. Um, that um, it suggests something that's, in terms of its meanings, is dissonant, not in terms of its actual musical language. Is dissonant. Okay, so this is Tchaikovsky. He composed three ballets. And the first of them was from um, 1877, and it's called Swan Lake. And um, Swan Lake, um, there's, a, there's a, a wonderful archivist of the Bolshoi Theater named Sergei Kanaev. Um, and uh, one of the amazing things happened is that Swan Lake is now brand new for us again. And I was able to write about that in this book, owing to the fact that um, you know, a few years ago, um, the Bolshoi Theater was renovated top to bottom at enormous cost, making it uh, smaller. It's a more intimate space now, fewer seats, uh, making it acoustically better once it was tuned and restoring some of the old moldings and you know some things were lost in the process of this top to bottom renovation but the theater was you know in really bad shape uh, the foundation needed to be shore up because you know moscow was built on tributaries of the moscow river and the, the foundations of the building were leaking so it had to be renovated from top to bottom but um, as part of that renovation um, it was discovered in the basement and attic of that theater manuscripts of various sorts and soldiers um, literally moved over um, this uh, treasure trove of unidentified stuff into the annex, the administrative annex of the Bolshoi Theater. And there, a team of people led by Sergei Kanaev have been busy um, photographing and identifying what they have there. And they have remarkable treasures in that space. Um, there's a lot of works that I, I fell in love with while working on this book that, um, that I ended up um, Wishing, you know, and having dreams about if only this this score existed, because I would love to see it. You know, we know this. You know, the Rubinstein opera, The Demon. Well, there was a there was a girl version called Satanella, Little Satan, I guess you would call it. And uh, this was a ballet that was extremely popular. It was a kind of contrafactum of a, of a Paris ballet, and uh, it was performed hundreds of times. You know, in the same really the same seasons as The Demon by Rubinstein, and then disappeared. But lo and behold, uh, all of the parts 
for this work survive, along with you know, details about the original scenario. So it allows the actual music to be put back together, and of course the dance is long gone, but you have a sense of it. So this is the kind of thing they found in there. And can I have also located um, the violin rehearsal score for the 1877 Swan Lake, um, which was a discovery that's you know, of shocking importance to ballet history. And that discovery allowed us to actually understand all of the things that we've never understood about Swan Lake. Like the plot there doesn't make so much sense. Like most ballets, they have shaky plots, thin plots, and some don't have plots at all. In the 19th and 20th century, which is okay, actually we don't want too much plot. Uh, earlier they wanted a lot of plot, earlier when ballet and opera were kind of hybrid. Uh, but over time, you know, the dance has been foregrounded, and the plot, like in something like Don Quixote, is like three sentences from its source novel, which is a very large novel by Cervantes. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so it was discovered, in fact, that Swan Lake uh, is not the creature that we know and love, or you know, some people love, you know, but regret that it's so dominant in the repertoire. But that Swan Lake um, was constructed very differently, uh, made more sense dramatically the first version, even though it was kind of a flop at the theater. Um, because of the choreography was unsuccessful. Uh, it was not Petit Pas, this was by a visiting Czech choreographer and uh, then Solon Reisinger. And there was a plot and a subplot, so there was the swan plot and then there was the village plot, um, which explains why there's some of these strange dances in the first act. So there was this plot and subplot, which was, there was no black swan in the original version. That was actually a fascinating development. Um, London's own Alistair Macaulay, who's now the New York Times uh, dance critic, um, pointed out to me that actually the idea of putting a black swan into Swan Lake arose almost simultaneously in three different places, Russia here and uh, in, in Paris as well. So it was this kind of strange World War II kind of innovation. Um, so the work changed over time, but in 1877 Tchaikovsky took on the commission to write a ballet called Swan Lake at a time when successful composers of operas and symphonies, which he was starting to be, who did not do this work. Um, composition for ballet was considered to be uh, the domain of, uh, I won't say lesser composers, but composers who were in-house musicians, like staff musicians. So Minkus, Ludwig Minkus, uh, Cesare Puni, and others in Russia did this kind of work. But he needed the money. Uh, he was approached by a friend as part of his literary circle uh, to do actually Degichev, was the person who did the scenario. And uh, he took it on for a pittance, and he composed this score, really not knowing much about ballet. Um, he, we think, um, learned how to compose uh, Swan Lake by studying a score uh, that was done by Yuli Gerber called The Fern, and that score has disappeared, perhaps because Tchaikovsky took it home <laughs> to study, <laughs> but it's gone, and, uh, but that seems to be one of the models. And the other one was uh, the Delib, uh, Sylvia, uh, these, this, this ballet score as well, and a little bit of Jitsov. But he put it together and the dancers uh, rejected it, and they thought the music was too complicated. And indeed, compared to Minkus, um, it had you know, more you know, sophisticated sounds, harmonies, uh, and certainly the rhythmic metric patterns were more complicated. And uh, the performance uh, was panned owing to the fact that the dance and the music did not get along very well with one another. But we know that there was uh, uh, a, you know, a rehearsal a violinist who hopped around with the dancers to put this thing together. Um, one of the things that constantly comes up at Princeton is they like, talk about the fact that we don't have the score of this ballet, we don't have the score of that ballet. That's because in the 19th century there weren't scores. You know, you had violin rehearsal score and that violinist tended to be the conductor, and so you don't need an orchestral score. We have parts, and that's how these things kind of assembled. And then it was only in the later 19th century that ballets began to be rehearsed at the piano. So the idea of a piano score came into being. Anyway, um, so with Swan Lake, uh, the reviews were pretty bad, except but there was one interesting innovation which made me fall in love with this whole project. There was, the ending was terribly sad, Swan Lake. Everybody drowned in a flood. And they actually made a flood on the stage of the Bolshoi Theater. And I thought that was amazing given the fact that, you know, it's not really done too often. Bluebeard's Castle by Bartok, sometimes they fill the stage with water, but this isn't done too often for obvious technical and <laughs> physical problems. But um, this was done by a genius at the theater, a machinist named Karl Waltz, who actually got it in his head that we're going to do it all the way. And uh, this was before the age of electricity. So I thought, well, how do you actually manufacture a flood on stage before the age of electricity? And they had batteries, and um, the battery technology was fairly elaborate. 
and uh, there was flood, there was water pumped in and fans, and uh, the music was drowned out, there was smoke in the hall, and uh, this was a kind of a success to scandal. This was the one thing that really stood out for this. And so, one of the interesting things it told me was spectacle um, in Swan Lake was important, more important than we tend to think about, and that the history of the Bolshoi Theater is actually very much linked up with great spectacle. Um, and so, just studying this, working with Kanayev on this uh, project, and he and I are, I'm translating his edition of all the source documents for the 1877 Swan Lake. Um, and one day, perhaps, that original version can be performed. I don't think the Bolshoi will do it, because the current version is, you know, it's really entrenched. I don't, I think to do an authentic version of it, you'd need batteries, which would be a hard thing, to take out the electricity, you know, so, and so on and so forth. But it's a fascinating sort of study in a sort of lost ballet. It kind of worked. Musically, it works better than the current version. It makes more sense, but the rest of it doesn't work so well. Um, but I, I got fascinated in, in what was going on in the theater that this spectacle was so important. And so um, I quickly, um, although I referenced recent events in the theater, including the renovation of the, in this book at the beginning and end, I quickly leapt into the deep past to actually find out how the Bolshoi was created, because I did not know. Now, most of my work is in the 20th century. And this, this involved running around several, some, you know, a big cluster of federal archives in Russia. And in the end, I learned that the Bolshoi Theater was founded by a prince in Moscow. Uh, Russians would want me to emphasize that prince. And then here in London, it would be emphasized the fact that it was co-founded by a uh, actor with the Haymarket Theater named Michael Maddox. And he uh, did these sort of magic shows, and he, he was a kind of wannabe diplomat, and he made his way doing running these sort of little theatrical events and sort of magic shows throughout Europe, and he ended up at the court of Catherine the Great through a very strange series of circumstances. And recognizing the fact that the theater, that Moscow did not have a public playhouse, it had served theaters at the States, like the Sheridan of the State, um, he actually collaborated with the prince to get a license, an opportunity to actually open up a public vaudeville house, um, which was near, about 200 yards away from the current Bolshoi Theater. And he put on song and dance shows, and uh, he ran up a lot of debt. And uh, he went bankrupt almost several times, uh, and he needed a bailout. The short story is that he need, needed a bailout, and where were banks in Russia? I learned these things. The only bank in Moscow, the big bank, was the uh, Imperial Foundling Home. That is to say, the orphanage in Moscow doubled as a bank and also doubled as a pawn shop. And uh, Maddox actually was given a loan to bail himself out of trouble. And part of the condition was that, um, and this is one of the wonderful innovations under Catherine the Great, uh, was she and her uh, education uh, commissar uh, were interested in the fact that these foundlings, children who had been abandoned, who were abandoned because they were, you know, children out of wedlock or from soldiers or whatever, and, you know, and um, they had a very wonderful institution uh, where the building still stands in Moscow, and they were educated in everything, and the idea. In, in sort of supporting these kids was actually to perhaps foster a kind of middle class you know, outside of the table of ranks. And the arts were important to them. So they sang and they danced, and Maddox, when he got into trouble and needed a loan from the orphanage, part of the deal was to take in talented pupils. And thus, in a strange way, kind of out of an orphanage, began the Bolshoi Ballet. Um, and the great thing for the history of Russian culture was that Maddox continued to go into debt. And he actually needed to be bailed out by the state. And once that happened, the theater became a state institution. And it was no longer a vaudeville house. Uh, and over the course of time, it became very, very important to uh, Russian history. Ballet, um, you know, was not opera. Uh, opera history in Russia, people tend to think of as beginning with Glinka. Um, but there are various other Russian composers before him. But the roots and origins have to do with the favoritism show to Italian opera in Russian society by the czars and the imperial theaters. Um, but ballet had a very, very troubled history, and so um, there was talk periodically in the 19th century about doing away with the Bolshoi ballet altogether. Um, Bolshoi dancers had, um, I think there's somebody at the door, I don't know. maybe. Anyway, Bolshoi uh, dancers had, um, in the 19th century, part-time jobs outside of the theater. Um, there are numerous ballets that have as their subject matter uh, milkmaids. So there's a ballet Naina or the Swiss milkmaid. And it's, a lot of ballet dancers actually were milkmaids. Um, they had, you know, second careers outside of the theater. Um, they were impoverished. 
And as part of one set of theatrical reforms, it was decided actually to cut the ranks of the Bolshoi altogether and threw a lot of dancers into poverty and put their lives, their lives and livelihoods at risk. Uh, but ultimately, the Bolshoi ballet was rescued um, by and, and funded properly by Alexander III, who actually began to cultivate a Russian art um, and thought of it, thought of this company as actually something that could support um, a kind of quasi-nationalist agenda. And so ballet became very important to coronation pageants. Even Petit Pa created ballets for various court coronation pageants. These ballets, um, there were for czarist occasions, um, were works that um, were kind of more like gala divertissement spectacles. So you'd have dances of various minerals and things that you, know, you could dig out of the land. The Russian Federation, you had dances of the various peoples of the Russian Federation or various peoples that would be in the future part of the Russian Federation, <coughs> this kind of colonialist aspect to it. Um, but this actually allowed the company to keep going, the fact that it was embraced by and actually used to some degree for this kind of diplomatic, if you will, or political ends. But what I think, and one of the things that I, I wanted to stress in this book was, I, always, I think that the Bolshoi theater um, has always privileged this idea of spectacle. It's never kind of lost some roots in the idea that it was catering to an audience which was not a court audience as you had in St. Petersburg. It was catering for the boyer class, more diverse audiences, students at the university fell in love with this place, they fell in love with one of the greatest dancers in ballet history, Ekaterina Sankovskaya, uh, who is like the Taglioni of Russia, although she's not celebrated as she should be. Um, and, um, but, but the idea of the showiness of the company and the idea that associated in the 20th century in the Soviet period that that stage was a place for great bravery and bravura dancing and this kind of Italian virtuosic import to Moscow and the idea that anything pop could happen on that stage or as it was said at Maya Plisetska, that dancers' dances or their lives depended on it on that stage I think has this roots in the distant past in the theater. Um, along with Swan Lake, one of the works I sort of got involved with was Don Quixote uh, which is a Russian ballet despite being based on Cervantes Petit Pas choreographed the original version, but he choreographed the original version for Moscow, and that was a version of the ballet that was uh, more improv theater than it is now known. And then he re-choreographed it a couple of years later for St. Petersburg. Um, and interestingly, the Moscow version of it had a far more nationalist context, Spanish dance content, had great stage effects in it, and uh, was again catering to an entirely different audience. So Petipa came down to Moscow, created this work, and then went back up to St. Petersburg, created a different version of it. I just want to show you the opening of this uh, ballet of Kitri's entrance. This is Maya Plisetska in that role. And you will see here um, her astonishing. <laughs> This is music by Minkus, choreography by Katsipa after the fact that uh, Maya Plisetska, you can marvel about the back, it's astonishing, and the fact that she can basically touch the back of her head with her foot, which is miraculous, and also that she uses the fan kind of as a weapon <laughs> to chase the boys away. Sanska has recently died, um, greatest dancer, Bolshoi dancer of the 20th century, in my opinion, most people's opinion. Um, and uh, obviously she owns the performance here, 
And uh, I would, I'd be terrified to be the conductor in the pit of this because, you know, with her commanding, really, um, she owns the performance and is creating this dance on stage here. Um, this is a distant uh, version of the original uh, 1869 um, Don Quixote, which is lost. It survives in the sort of bodies of dancers, kinetic tradition. And uh, this, this performance is definitive. Her entrance is Kichwi in this. Uh, she's not the most serious dancer character in the ballet canon, but um, in terms of uh, her spirit, um, she's astonishing. Um, she is uh, somebody I focus on in the last chapter of this book simply because I thought um, she was interesting to sort of, um, her career was fascinating and, and, and devastating in many respects and all conquering on other levels. Um, she was somebody who um, has written, wrote I, Maya Plasetska, a very powerful and it turned out uh, completely accurate uh, autobiography. This is one of the things I thought, well, I'm going to write about Maya Plasetska. She wrote this book, you know, it, does it check out? You know, and it does 100%. Everything she says in that book uh, seems to have been true and happened. Um, and the sort of so called gossip in the book, uh, a lot of it actually comes from her. Um, the, um, the 20th century uh, history of the theater uh, was something that, um, uh, it's, it's a troubled history in the sense that um, ballet had a hard time adapting to the strictures of uh, the Soviets. Uh, so the revolution took place, there was a long discussion amongst Lenin and uh, the Bolsheviks' his cohort about whether or not the Bolshevik theater should be shuttered um, because it was expensive to run, to heat during a terrible period because it was associated with the imperial grandeur, but of course uh, they made the wise decision to preserve this uh, cultural edifice and with it a lot of the repertoire. So the repertoire was tweaked to some degree, Swan Lake's ending became happier and happier over time, but it remained uh, intact and that's why we have it. Storytelling ballets, which is one of the distinguishing features of the Bolshoi Contra, what took place in the United States with Balanchine, all important, that's the thing that actually keeps ballet going, that we all know and love. Uh, is a 19th century thing, but also a 20th century thing. So the Soviets privileged storytelling that way. Some degree allegorically, um, some, to some degree there was a political agenda associated with it. Um, it took a long time for the Bolshoi to figure out how to actually create a ballet that would be something that would respond to Soviet subject matter. Um, there were a lot of false attempts. There were some radical attempts to actually create ballets which were about soccer games and actually change choreography altogether. But the first, I think, big success was the Red Poppy. Um, which is a work from the 20s, uh, which is a hybrid 19th and 20th century concoction. A lot of the dances is very much a grand ballet with a dream scene, but the subject matter is set in Shanghai near Shanghai the port there, and involves Soviet sailors coming into contact with communist uh, their brethren. Um, but um, the work, um, you know, this first Soviet ballet was something that was not going to be performed, despite all the effort put into it. Mr. Prokofiev, Sergei Sergeyevich was in 1927 coming back to the Soviet Union and has decided to put on his opera, Love of Three Oranges, in a big spectacular production at the Bolshoi. But then, because of actual political events involving Stalin's support for Chinese communists, it was decided to actually give the green light to the Red Poppy on the Soviet stage, since there's a lot of documentation about it. The title, The Red Poppy, was actually something that, um, uh, I actually, there's a lot of discussion as to why did you call this ballet the Red Poppy in the literature and some questions about it because poppy is associated with the opium trade and if this work is supporting Chinese uh, revolutionaries, why would you, you know, associate them with the opium trade which is about colonialism and is to some degree insulting. Um, but Glier, the people involved in it, Geltzer, Tikamira decided to call it the Red Poppy. Then uh, when the Chinese delegation came to see the ballet, 40s, they got upset about it, they changed it to the Red Flower, and then after the Cultural Revolution, when things weren't so good between USSR and China, it became the Red Poppy again. Um, typical sort of history. Um, I wish, actually, Red Poppy were performed more often. Um, it's a grand ballet, it's spectacular, it's a lot, the score is in a nice light style, but it has a great deal of appeal to it, and um, I, I, was, I thought maybe, maybe in this year, 17, that someone would put it on, it doesn't seem likely. Um, the uh, dominant figure choreographically in the 20th century in the Soviet sphere is uh, Yuri Nikolaevich Grigorovich, uh, whom I had the uh, privilege of meeting um, at his uh, country home, and um, uh, it was a very, very deeply moving experience for me, uh, meeting him and actually talking with him. And uh, I actually came away from that, that day with him um, thinking that what he had done was really astonishing and remarkable. Um, he created ballets, which you know, some critics don't like, but um, the career and um, 
the personality behind the career, which was very dominating. Uh, he was, to some degree, at antipodes with Maya Plisetska, the star dancer, you know, against the star choreographer. Uh, but both of them were remarkable in different ways. Um, I just want to show you an excerpt from his uh, landmark Soviet achievement, which was Spartacus, which is a work with a thin ideological plot, you know, Roman slaves, uh, revolution. And it's so easy and so obvious that you can ignore it and just focus on the tremendous dancing. And maybe actually the slave rebellion is less important because the dancing of Crassus, the Roman leader, is better. Depending on the production you see, it's all up in the air, ideologically. But um, this is a, a definitive uh, performance of that. Uh, Spartacus. Spartacus, which was a long and tortured process. Uh, Judo Kachaturian actually composed the music of this. Um, there are three different choreographies of it, um, including uh, Jakobsen, um, Moiseev Jakobsen, and then the Grigorovich version of it. And um, the first two were semi failures, although the second one went on tour uh, in the Bolshoi Theater in New York City. And there, the reviewers in New York mixed it up. They actually simultaneously in New York, Spartacus is being done as well as Stanley Kubrick's film, Spartacus, they began to mix, mix up the reviews. So the criticism of the ballet was actually the film. Really absurd. Uh, but uh, this version of it, uh, Grigorovich actually got a hold of the score um, and actually just resorted the music uh, without Kachaturi in present. Uh, like basically reordered it, um, cut out a lot of music, um, structured in a very musical way with a very sort of symmetrical structure that would make it more translate more easily. Um, pretty ingenious what he did to it, but of course uh, Hitchturian was upset at seeing his score like in the very <laughs> big pages torn out of it and I think he had to be applied with uh, uh, his favorite uh, cognac for a while and uh, he had some complaints about, you know, where are the women and so forth, but in the end this, this ballet was staged and more or less um, timed with a, a anniversary year for the uh, revolution, a little late, but it got on stage and remained there. But uh, despite its ideological obviousness uh, to this day, um, people will go to see this work. I mean, in Moscow now, um, I've heard from smart uh, ballet critics like Tatiana Kuznetsova that if you put this work on, you put on Ivan the Terrible, it's kind of more for tourists. You know, it's, it's like along with your, you know, Kalishnikov full of vodka and chocolates, you go and see this. <laughs> But uh, I've seen Spartacus, the Bolshoi came on tour a few years ago, came to New York City, and they put this on, and, um, and it was packed. It was absolutely packed, and you know, it was, just, it was just this huge party. And to me, once again, it reinforced the idea, this idea of like, spectacle and audience pleasing and you know, real engagement um, was, was all important. Um, the antipode to... Um, to Grigorovich in the theater was his note of my Plisetska, and um, I, I will never get over reading and then looking in the archive for the supporting material of the story of how she became a great dancer. This, this talent of hers was God-given. Um, her mother recalls the, the baby basically poised on her daddy's palm, you know, um, as well as almost jumping out the window. And, but the fact that you know, she lost her parents you know, early on to the purges, uh, her daddy, the story that she tells of that um, is, is, is de absolutely devastating. 
And um, the fact is that talent of her, she would have been prima assoluta no matter what happened. But she, her path to, to stardom was accelerated owing to the fact that in the period in the 30s and the 40s, so many people in Bolshoi disappeared. You know? And so that you could have, perversely, in the Gulag system, uh, ballets like the Red Poppy performed. You know? I learned this study in Lena Prokofiev, the fact that she, one of the ways that she made it through the, the labor camps and survived that was actually she led a choir. You know, there was cultural events there. It was very boring you know, for the guards. So, and little ballets were performed as well, including the Red Poppy. But um, this uh, is iconic um, in a different way than Don Quixote, what it is. The last thing I want to show you before I stop, and, and then we can just, um, uh, I can happily talk more generally about different aspects of the theater's history, is um, something from um, Alexei Rachmansky, who was the artistic director for a brief period of the theater. Um, and is now in New York, and he did, um, he loves to, um, his career is fascinating because I think that he, he loves this, the 30s and the 20s, this wonderful cultural revolution period. And I think he, um, having con talked with him a little bit about this and recognizing that he does all sorts of things, I think he has built his career to some degree on imagining what would have happened had the cultural revolution continued. And his career, he's kind of like starting you know, in 1932, his own choreographer. And he's sort of the great, I mean, he's very much in demand worldwide, a great storytelling uh, genius. And he's gone back to some of the, you know, the chestnuts of the Cultural Revolution period, including the Flames of Paris, and he's accelerated them and giving them this cutting edge that they probably had in the original, but with dulled over time. I'm going to show you the last dance from <coughs> Flames of Paris, and I'm going to stop. Uh, and this is... Uh, Incredible dancing in its own right. heartedness, all of the things, besides the fact that this is incredibly great corps de ballet that makes the Bolshoi great. Um, but this, this thing that, this is Bolshoi, I think, vibrancy um, brought uh, now to the world stage. The last hip over there. Um, the one of the things is, I, I regrettably these days live in the United States. <laughs> and uh, in the sense that uh, we're in this kind of uh, turmoil. And uh, one of the things that um, I've, I've said in, in various talks is, I think right now language is letting us down. Words are letting us down. They're turning us into caricatures, like social media tweets and all of this. And I, 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 these performances, and I think some of the energy of this company, specifically went on a tour on the Cold War, um, music and dance actually had this force of actually bringing people together that, um, that I don't think actually language actually can do, or cannot do anymore. Um, so this is a little bit of uh, what I consider to be the magic of this theater. I could talk about why programs have wax stains on it because there was no electricity in the theater and the streets of Moscow are dark and various other things, but I'll just stop there and continue the questions. Thank you.
what was one of your biggest surprises when you were doing this research or something that you didn't expect to come across? I didn't expect, I didn't expect uh, Yekaterina Stankovska. Um, there's a chapter, I, I, didn't, I mean, for, for, I have to say I didn't know what I was doing this project. Um, and everyone said, I remember meeting Vladimir Uren, and he said, oh, and I think Katja Novikova said, oh, he's interested in writing a book about the Bolshevik history, and then he just said, Svoljna, you know, like, get out of here. Uh, and he was correct, but uh, I actually just thought that maybe um, the story, the people in the archives, you know, I won't say ghosts, but, you know, these, these, these presences in, in the archives could um, come to life. And there was this dancer, um, absolutely astonishing. And um, she um, dominated the Moscow scene like no other dancer in either city uh, could. And so I was the fact that there was this rival, I think, to Taglioni and Elser, and I think that somebody should um, dedicate a book to her and say, actually, you know what? I, you know, like we say, Taglioni is the first great, you know, ballerina tradition. But actually, there was, meantime, you know, in Moscow, this phenomenal talent. And uh, the reviews of her, people just went to see her and they just saw her again and again and again and again. And it was just like, just this complete compulsive necessity for a lot of people who actually were not that invested in that. And you know, they described what she did in minute detail so you can get a real good sense of her syntax. She also, um, at the end, taught and she gave specific choreographic notes to students. So actually you can get a sense of the kind of steps that were in certain works that were considered lost. So that was a real find for me. Spent some time at the Bakushin Museum, uh, going into her modest archive. That's where the lone oil portrait of her is. Um, so. Sir. Um, <clears throat> my grandfather played in the orchestra, the violin, from 1909 to 1924. And I was interested, that led to two questions. Yeah. One, I was interested in what you said about the early 20s, because mm -hmm. I know he was, uh, he was concertmaster, but he was reduced to making felt boots to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was really a bad time. Um, and the second question is about the relationship between the Bolshoi Orchestra and the, or Bolshoi Ballet and the Ballet Russe. Um, yeah, um, well, that, the hard to survive um, story, um, you know, things were terrible all over, right, for during the Civil War and the Revolution, mm -hmm. right? There's no, the winters were harsh and there was this sort of thing, it collapsed. Um, and um, the theater did various things to keep going including holding like raffles and lotteries. I mean, it's strange to see the details of this and uh, recycling shoes. And so it, this is not an untypical story. It's a sad story. Um, the fact that it survived again is heroic. With regard to the Ballet Russe, the, ten the narrative tends to be that, you know, before the revolution, there was this vast emigre movement to Paris and all the great art, you know, great, not all, but a lot of great artists ended up in Paris. And that Stravinsky, you know, created his first three famous ballets, including the Rite of Spring, which he never lived down in terms of fame, composed out at age 31. Um, so Firebird, Petrushka, Rite of Spring, they're done in Paris, Ballet Russe, 1910, 11, 13. That's actually one of my questions. But, um, Rite of Spring, the premiere was 1909 in, in Moscow. No. 1913 is the Rite of Spring, is premiere, right? May 29th. Yeah, Ballet Russe, but in Moscow, it was 1909. Maybe 1912. Um, there, there was a premiere in Moscow. The my the, grandfather played. Well, it's Moscow premiere. What what, I'll, what I'll, my sense of it my sense of it is that and you're you're not wrong. What I was surprised to find out that the common narrative that was constructed over the 20th century is that once Stravinsky left, he was persona non grata until 1962, and he came back to Russia and kissed the ground, and then he was welcome back. That's not true at all. Petrushka, Firebird, and there was a lot of talk about Right of Spring, and then Svatopol and Nos. They were performed at the Bolshoi Theater. And what's fascinating, Petrushka, which was done a lot, was that they performed it in a way that I think you would nowadays consider to be more authentic than what was done in Paris. So this is a fairground spectacle, and they really had this arch, you know, ultra-realism on the stage of the Bolshoi. And that, that was really surprising to me to see, actually, that, in fact, they left, but, you know, it was still 100% European, you know, Russia. Was, there was no cutoff. That's, that's the kind of figment. Cold War dreams, fantasies of people, you know, on both sides of the Cold War, I think. So the fact, I mean, I don't exactly know when you have in mind, but I completely believe that, you know, there was this cross-trafficking in these works. Um, and certainly in the case of Prokofiev, uh, his ballet Le Pas d'Acier, which was conceived for Diaglav in Paris, the idea was actually that work was meant 
for the Agalev's company to go on tour to the Soviet sphere and perform. You know, it didn't work out, but the intention was fully to actually come back. Hi. Sir. Um, Mike, the first ever ballet score that I got to know um, in its entirety was Swan Day, which mm -hmm. you started talking, talking mm -hmm. about. And I, I accept what you said, that it would be marvelous to, to experience the original or, or Swan Day mm -hmm. as it was first performed in Moscow in 1877, because the um, the posthumous Swan Day, one that was put on um, in 1894 for the first anniversary, I think, of Tchaikovsky's death, right. is almost a completely different work to the one that Tchaikovsky wrote in the 1870s. And I got to know um, the Rostislavsky complete recording um, with the Moscow uh, Radio Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. And I was, I was completely bowled over by how much music there was that we don't ever hear in the opera house nowadays, mm -hmm. and how much people like Grigo sort of um, refashioned it after Tchaikovsky's death. Um, and I know that there was this project <coughs> which was some years ago when they actually performed in Russia the original, was near as the original, Sleeping Beauty. Um, and here, yeah. And, 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 and subsequently here. here. And I was struck by how much longer, how much, how much more meat, meaty there was, meat there was in the original versions than the ones you get nowadays, which are very, very truncated. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and, and that's why I hope you would agree with what I say that I would love to hear the original Boris one day done, one, done just once so well, that people could get the measure of the full work in its original ordering, sequence and staging, which you don't get nowadays, um, except when I once heard it done by the, the Stanislavski um, theatre when they brought it over to London where we got the, some idea of the original dance sequences in their original context. I agree with you. I think uh, it'd be fascinating to hear the score with the Drigo layer scraped away. So Petit Pa, when he, you know, he basically staged Sleeping Beauty, it was this incredible success, the Nutcracker, and then Tchaikovsky dies, and Petit Pa is literally thinking, well, what was that first failed ballet that this guy did? Maybe we can bring that, you know, revive it. And he classicalized it, he changed it. He had the in-house uh, orchestrator, musician at the Marinsky, Drigo, go in there and change it, uh, piled on the strings, thickened it, um, added a lot to the ending, uh, for, made it you know a little bit more bombastic. Um, people, uh, well, Alistair McCauley is one who actually thinks that it's probably a better score than the original. I disagree because I think a lot in terms of the musical logic and even in terms of key symbolism, um, you know, specific keys associated with specific things that disappeared. Um, we cannot put together. I don't think very easily the original staging because we know now that, um, for example, when it was done in 1877, the choreographer Reisinger recycled um, dances from previous ballets, including one based on Jules Wern's Around the World in 80 Days, which was done in Paris, and he actually took one of the dances and stuck it into Act 1. So it was a kind of a compilation <coughs> dance track, if you will, you know, various things put together. But the fact that there was this plot involving, you know, to swan, and then there was, it wasn't black swan, white swan, it was swan world, and then village girl number one and two. You know, there was this kind of real world parallel to the supernatural world, which kind of musically makes more sense. So, so I think that there's a way in which those things, things could be put back together. But let me, let me just ask you this basic question about like restoration. It's like, Nutcracker is performed all the time, right? Why is it never performed with the English dance in there? The Royal Ballet does it. Chinese dance, Arabia, all this. Why is the English dance never performed? He composed it. It's cute. It's not there. It was dropped from the first production in 1892 at the Imperial Theatres. So I don't know why. But he composed it. And why doesn't the royal perform it as part of the suite with China and Arabia? What? Isn't it not 
my memory tells me, is it not included in the recording by Alvin Pebble? Yes, with an orchestration by John Lansbury, that, that version. My, memory tells me, it's, my understanding is it's rarely danced. I mean, I'm, would you correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I, I mean, <coughs> Covent Garden, they should do the English dance, why not? It's, you know, just put it into the mix. But, you know, so there are, there are ways, there are three portions of music that in the Nutcracker, of all things, that we actually don't get to hear. Drosselmeyer's more chromatic, darker character. So, um... But Andre doesn't include it in his recording, I think. Yeah, it, Tchaikovsky didn't orchestrate it. It was, like, it was like, it was just dropped from the mix at the beginning. I, I think it would be great to dance it with all the rest, maybe in London, for obvious reasons. Uh, but you know, it's, it's attitudinally like the rest of them, and it should be there. Um, and remember, this was just after he got his Cambridge PhD, so. You know, his nationalism, his nationalism. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am. So, um, can I build more than history? Yeah. I was wondering if you had an opinion on contemporary kind of repertoire of Mozart, because I think that in particular, um, I had two parts of the question, and mm -hmm. whichever one you feel more comfortable asking mm -hmm. both. Uh, so the Bolshoi has been going on tour forever, since mm -hmm. like the 50s, right? Mm -hmm. So it was like a stable touring company of the Soviet Union. And it continues to go on tour every year, comes to London a lot. So I was wondering if you could comment on your opinion on their current programming within Russia and what the touring, the programming on tour, and perhaps even how it compares to the Soviet times. Um, the simple answer is, I mean, in terms of what the repertoire will be like, in the future, we don't know yet because Vaziev has just taken over as you know artistic director of the Gold Ballet, and so what he does, whether or not it actually is something that becomes more cosmopolitan in terms of the mix of ballets they stage or more Russian focused, it's, it's unclear at the moment. Um, what I one of the things I noticed in uh, my limited work on this is that to the present day, um, there's still a lot of the Soviet repertoire that's actually toured. You know, because of, I don't know, I mean, the New York experience was fascinating for me because they do like Romeo and Juliet, Grigorovich version, not Lavrovsky. Um, they'll do a Giselle, so they'll acknowledge the kind of international repertoire. And then something like Spartacus and then X, you know, another work. And um, my sense of it is that at home, um, it's, well, I think the, the last interesting big work they did was Hero of Our Time. And they actually created a new grand ballet, uh, which did really well. Uh, people liked that. It was a lament of you know, celebration. And that, that doesn't seem to be something that they're considering touring with, because I do think that they're still thinking about what, what brings people to a box office in other places. But I would love to see that on tour. You know, um, you know this summer, you know, the, you know, the Bright Stream, the, the updated version of that that Romansky did, which is marvelous. Um, that's a ballet that um, he really decided to actually, what was it in 1935 that made that ballet so successful for a while and then it was completely stomped out. You know, this was a ballet that was staged in 1935, like city folk, it's like kind of Oklahoma, you know, city folk and then the country folk were on a collective farm, a mixture of identities, you know, cross-dressing, all of that sort of games fun, vaudeville. Um, and what's one of the most beautiful details of that, and I, I love this, and people might not like this, but when that ballet was being produced for the Bolshoi Theater, to make sure that ballet worked, they brought in people, workers, farmers, gave them questionnaires. What did, did you understand the plot as danced? Did you understand the pantomime? Did you like this? Did you like that? And they beautifully filled out these questionnaires, you know, sometimes in crayon, you know, very childlike. Um, and they changed the work accordingly. You know, for the audience, and I personally, I, I, I kind of think that's really wonderful. You know, uh, but then, then uh, what happened was it was removed uh, for reasons that had nothing to do with the ballet, really. Um, in 1936, this Committee Padilla was established, and that was chopped down censorship. And the number one composer in the land and the number one choreographer in the land were associated with the Bright Stream. So, oh, likewise, Lady Macbeth and the censorship District out as a lesson, uh, as a demonstration. And, uh, but Rydmansky went back and to that original concept, and um, as he did with Bolt, and uh, he put it on, and it's, it's just marvelous you know, to actually see that 1935 happiness. Um, and uh, so they're doing that at the Bolshoi now. So the Rydmansky, although he's left, is still considered, I think, the last major choreographer to actually change the repertoire. Um, 
and then we'll see what happens with your own time in the future. It's, it's, I, can't, I can't answer the question because, you know, A, I'm a historian, so the future is a problem. But I just don't think we know really what's going to happen. Sir? One last question. Yeah. Why, why do you think Russia has become a tourist attraction in Russia? How did that happen? Tourist attraction? Um, well, it was already in the 19th century, it was used for diplomatic events. So uh, when diplomats would come, and actually the opening of the Kavos version of the building, which is the restoration is after that one, there was a, an international London Illustrated News sent a delegation to actually see this brand new theater, which was colossal and wonderful. It became a tourist attraction. Um, Because, for various reasons, I'd always had the idea of a showcase for, you know, if you think about the size of the Russian Empire and you think about two major ballet schools and houses, the talent that, that concentrates in those two places. So you're seeing absolutely spectacular dancing. Um, you are seeing uh, this beautiful hall and you are seeing uh, basically reinforced in the 20th century was the fact that in the late 19th century, Russia claimed ballet for itself. And that begins with Sleeping Beauty. But that ballet is very much about, if you actually think about the dancing in Sleeping Beauty, Aurora the heroine, this is a long answer to your question, Aurora the heroine morphs from being La Fontaine to Taglioni to the end, Paola, you know, the end, that's how she dances. So that was a work that claimed the history of ballet for Russia. And so that, on, on a lot of levels, was so became the Russian art. And the Bolshoi, as the state academic Bolshoi theater right beside the Kremlin became the theater of the Soviet Union. And that showcase was allowed for various reasons to tour and um, it generated enormous crowds, especially in a period when things were closed off, people would go and see those dancers and um, from the London tour that began in 57 to the subsequent tours, they came and in good times and bad times they performed in a way that actually was generous and open and everybody missed them when they were gone they brought that kind of you know, energy and life to places far away. Yeah. Um, among the current Bolshoi soloists, do you see anyone who could perhaps not replace but could be seen as a successor to Pisetska's fame and quality of dance? Well, there are the, well, now because everything is global, right? Vishnova, <coughs> Sipova, these are different kinds of dancers, but I find this Sipova absolutely enchanting. If you see her doing Capelia, it's like nothing else. It's just unearthly. Uh, Svetlana Zakharova is the eminence now, uh, the theater. And, um, you know, um, she's, she's not uh, Pasetska in terms of technique, but she's dominant. So I'd say that, you know, there's more diversity of technique and style. Um, and but at the same time, it's now a global global art form. And um, you know, they after the collapse of the Soviet sphere in the 90s, which was terrible. You know, they lost so much talent. But now, I think people are just effortlessly, you know, multi-entry bees international and so on. But I, I think now the talent in terms of the dancers is at that level. And then um, Smirnova, Olga Smirnova, she is um, still young, and she is I don't know. Used to be said that uh, you know, maybe the last romantic ballerina had passed, but maybe Smirnova is the kind of last romantic ballerina. So I think that there's 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 amazing talent in there, and it's just very diverse in terms of technique. The period in question with Plisetska, she just dominated over everybody else um, for a lot of reasons. All right. Oh, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, hi. Sorry, I just wanted to ask you um, two small um, questions. So one, uh, besides the touring and the stuff we were talking about, what was the nature of engagement uh, of the Bolshevik ballet with the outside world? Of course, you know, they're not just only in the West, but also in, the, you know, in uh, Asia and Africa and uh, Egypt, for example. So, and there was a quite an extensive engagement with Cuban ballet, and at some point, you know, it was um, seen to be, or Cuban ballet seemed to be too essential, some of the, some of the collaboration didn't work out. So, uh, hence the related question, can we talk at all about a sort of a model Soviet ballet that was Bolshoi, or was it sort of beyond, in a way, 
ideology and you can't actually uh, kind of place it within a sort of socialist or socialist culture that, you know, um, um, it's a it's a great question. It's a complicated one. With the example of Cuba, for example, there is a uh, there's political reasons for it. But Alonso, Alicia Alonso, that dancer, and her brother-in-law um, were collaborated with Tsetska and Carmen Sweet. You know, that became Tsetska's ballet. But there is a fantastic uh, classical ballet tradition that's established in Cuba that has a lot to do with cross trafficking and cultural exchange and sure. Um The um, interesting thing that um, I noticed in researching the Soviet period is uh, one of the things that was lost and gained was this issue of narrative. So with Balanchine and this pursuit of so-called Cold War formalism, right? So ballet is pure, abstract, non-narrative, and so forth. When the Bolshoi would tour with these narratives and stories and would tell stories in dance, um, there was like, oh, isn't that quaint? It's so 19th century, still clinging to this tradition. But on the other hand, this is something we desire and we don't have. Um, but um, one of the things I, I learned, because people wrote me letters, was that uh, Brazil, for example, inherited a lot of, not only even, also inherited a lot of Belarus, you know, down there. So the brand, if you will, um, actually was trafficked in different ways around the globe beyond ideology. Um, this, this question, though, about, um, the, the one question I want to hone in on, though, is that issue about politics and dance. Some people actually don't think dance can be political. Um, <laughs> and maybe decor can and costumes can and, and gesture can, but you know, there's this argument, or maybe music can't be political. But one of the things I, I wondered, when I started this book, I thought, oh, is this going to be a story, a kind of cliched story about the fact that despite bad times, despite sometimes the theater burned down, despite sometimes the theater went bankrupt, despite politics, great art was created, you know, despite that. And then I actually realized it's the opposite. There's something about cultural consciousness that is because of these things mm -hmm. that actually allow these masterpieces to be created. And that's something that's inexplicable and mysterious, you know, and it's almost existential, but it's something I actually came to believe. That there was something about taking darkness and actually turning it into gold, which is an old Pushkin trope, um, that's actually something that's pertinent to the history of the ballet, the Bolshevik ballet. And I don't think that in other places, certainly New York City Ballet, which had a strange start as Ballet Caravan, as a narrative vehicle that became abstract, I don't think that necessarily happened. And so, although there were a few ballets created in the Soviet sphere, and we can think of Spartacus as maybe the iconic sort of later Soviet ballet, I do think <coughs> that, uh, what emerged from tough times um, is something that, frankly, I, I cannot to this day get my head around like how, in fact, these masterpieces were created. And I try to, in many instances, figure that out. Like, what were the pressures that were fueled, as opposed to things you resisted, that allowed these things to come into being? Uh, and I do think that that's a difference um, that's uh, really important. The other thing I'll say in response to your question is, I had a conversation the last time I was at Bolshevik, a year or two ago, with Katya Novikola, the press secretary, a very smart person, polyglot. And she talked about Spartacus. You know, it's this question, why do you tour that work and yet you don't perform it at home so much? And she said, you know, the world is getting more and more the same everywhere. You know, everywhere the same service, the same things. What's wrong with difference? And actually, this work that's associated with the Soviet experience, that bit of difference, that <laughs> bit of exotic, if you will. You know, there was exotic in the 19th century associated with the Far East, and then there was a Soviet thing that's not exotic. What's wrong with actually preserving that bit of difference? And I didn't have an answer to that. Because yeah. I think it's actually, and they, they want, they will preserve that. You know, so there's just the showiness, the virtuosity, and I think some of that repertoire as well. They're not going to just erase it and suppress it. So, and I think that's a good thing. All right, I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for coming to a very stimulating tour. Um, the books are on sale upstairs, and I'm sure you'd be happy to sign them. Sure. Um, we have a awards dinner on the 7th of June, at which the announcement will be made of who's won the, short, the, the prize. Um, we have four more events connected to the book prize coming up over the next six weeks, different authors speaking. Tonight was our first, so please look at the programme and come to the other events. 
Um, they are very broad ranging. So we have the Russian Canvas by Polly Gray, that's on the 25th or 6th of May, um, about imperial, imperial painting. She's also dug into the archives and found some material that hasn't been brought to light before. We've got, um, who else? We've got Anne Garrels talking about, her, a journalist, Anne Garrels talking, what's it called, Putin's Russia, her book? Putin Country. Putin Country, on the 5th of June. Um, and we have, I'm going blank, Becky. Yeah, so on the Simon, first, no, I'll ask you on. <laughs> we have um, uh, the author, Benora Bennett, talking to the translators of Teffy's book, um, Memories from Moscow to the Black Sea, which is like on the 30th of May. May. And then Anne Garrels on the 5th of June. Um, and then on the 12th of June, we have Daniel Beard talking about his book, House of the Dead, which is um, about. Um, Siberian exile. And he's in conversation with Anne Apple that yeah. night because she wrote about the Gulag. So um, the, the, the dinner on the 7th of June is actually ticketed, so if anyone would like to come, there's information on our website. And if you're not a friend of Pushkin House, I'd encourage you to become a friend. We're self-funding, independent, um, so please help us to stay that way. But um, please join me in thanking Simon for this evening's talk.